Perfect. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, this is the, the last talk of today, and um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers for putting together uh, this online conference. I really appreciate it because I think it's super important that we continue uh, having these kind of, uh, kinds of meetings. And it's therefore my great pleasure to give this talk on the modulation of dark matter signals. Um, this has been alluded to by various speakers before, but I want to stress before I begin that this is going to be a theorist perspective. So apologies in advance if I will be short on uh, the kind of experimental technologies and, and details. Instead, I will try and uh, give a bit of an overview of the underlying concepts and, and the kind of challenges in terms of interpretation. Uh, so to get started, just uh, a very basic slide on, on why do we look for, for modulation. Uh, the point is that this is a, a characteristic of potential dark matter signals. As we will see, many dark matter signals will have some specific uh, time dependence, which should be different uh, from backgrounds. Uh, many backgrounds you would expect to be time independent or in some way non-periodic. Uh, and therefore, uh, looking for the time dependence, of course, offers a promising way to discriminate signal from background, uh, much like the directionality that we heard about just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there may, of course, uh, be and there will be periodic backgrounds, but you could imagine that those will be eliminated either if you rotate uh, the experiment uh, when looking for um, certain types of daily modulation that we will talk about, or by moving it to a different location uh, with, for example, different seasonal variations. Uh, so in, in principle, the idea of looking for a modulation uh, uh, offers the possibility to uh, substantially increase the exposure of an experiment or uh, to lower the threshold, even if that means having a non-negligible background rate. Um, but of course, ultimately, what we really want to do is once we see a signal uh, to somehow conclusively uh, demonstrate uh, the dark matter origin. And for this, it, it will be essential to kind of map out the time dependence and confirm that this agrees with, uh, with expectations. So I'm, I'm going to talk about two things. Uh, first, annual modulations and then daily or diurnal modulations. Um, so to start with, with annual modulations, uh, just very quickly, the origin, as, as we've heard about before, uh, is the motion of the sun through the Milky Way with a velocity of about 220 kilometers per second. And this leads to a boost of the dark matter velocity distribution. This is isotropic in, in the galactic frame, but then in the laboratory frame, we effectively see what is called a wimp wind coming from the direction of Cygnus. Now on top of the motion of the sun, the earth also moves around the sun and this motion uh, slightly increases the boost in summer and, and slightly decreases it in winter. So as a result, we see a larger and a more energetic flux of dark matter particles in summer than in winter. Uh, the magnitude of this effect you can very roughly estimate by the ratio of the two velocities, so earth velocity divided by sun velocity, to be of the order of 15%. This is uh, cheating a bit because the velocities aren't aligned, so it's more like 10% or a bit less, but you can conceivably have larger modulations if you're looking for a signal very close to threshold. Uh, so this is the, the basic setup. And when we, when we talk about annual modulations, of course, we have to talk about the DAMA signal. So the DAMA experiment has been searching for annual modulation and has been observing evidence for such modulation in presumably their nuclear recoil data at a very high significance. They quote something like 13 sigma in their most recent publication. And uh, what, what makes this uh, result uh, so intriguing is that the, both the phase and the energy dependence of this modulation are roughly consistent with what you would expect for a, for a WIMP with mass in the range of 10 to 100 GeV. Uh, however, if you look in, in more detail, it actually doesn't, doesn't look quite perfect. So if you look at the most recent DAMA release, then the energy dependence um, that you're seeing in the modulation does not quite agree with expectations for dark matter nuclear scattering. So neither if you assume scattering on, on sodium, which is here on the left, nor if you assume scattering on iodine here on the right, you get a very good fit uh, to the data. Uh, this has been pointed out by, by several independent groups, uh, but it's worth emphasizing that DAMA actually disputes this claim. They had a paper last year where they argue that, that the fit to, to their data is perfectly acceptable. 
uh, now this uh, this is difficult to to resolve at least from my perspective uh, because the information of the energy resolution in Dharma close to threshold uh, is not public uh, so uh, basically any independent group has to make some assumption on this energy resolution which very much influences these fits so this is difficult somehow to to really resolve uh, at the moment uh, however there's a much bigger problem uh, with the Dharma interpretation which is that any best fit point in terms of dark matter nuclear scattering is in vast tension with other direct detection experiments. So just to, to quote from a paper from late last year, uh, in this paper, they looked at essentially the most general set of um, non-relativistic operators describing elastic dark matter nuclear scattering. And they write in the conclusions that for all the minima, the corresponding predicted number of events exceeds by more than three orders of magnitude, the upper bound from xenon one ton and or pico 60. So, this is really essentially saying that there is no known consistent interpretation in terms of elastic dark matter nucleus scattering. There are some uncertainties to this conclusion from the kind of experimental response, things like quenching factors, uh, but it was shown that this is essentially insufficient, so that the uncertainty is insufficient to change this conclusion in any significant way. So, uh, of course, now at this point, uh, you really need to worry about backgrounds again and whether there might be a background that actually does explain the Dharma modulation. Now to date, or at least to the best of my knowledge, there's no such uh, known background, uh, but there were two very interesting papers earlier this year which suggested that there could be an artificial annual modulation as a product of how a slowly varying total rate is being subtracted. So if you have a rate that, that slowly changes over time, and then you average that rate over intervals of approximately one year, you essentially impose a modulation on your data. Now this modulation wouldn't be sinusoidal, but would be more like a, a sawtooth. Uh, but as you can see here, this is actually not a, a horrible fit to, to Dharma data. Um, of course, whether or not this is something that, that is actually done by the Dharma collaboration is again impossible from the outside to tell, but in principle, it should be very easy for them to to test and, and confirm or, or refute. Um, so so as, as has been for many years, the situation around Dharma is kind of inconclusive. So we at least need to entertain the possibility that the Dharma signal is due to some unknown type of dark matter interactions that scales in an unknown way for different detector materials. I don't think really any such theory has been worked out. So we, we don't really know of of any plausible model, model of dark matter that would bring the Dharma signal into agreement with, with other null results. But we need to somehow live with, with that possibility. And the only way to settle that controversy is to have independent experiments that employ the exact same target material, sodium iodine. And indeed, there are now two ongoing experiments that will do just that, uh, COSINE in South Korea and ANAES in, in Spain. Uh, this is a plot from a paper from COSINE 100 from last year, where they searched for an annual modulation in their data and essentially placed an upper bound, which however is still consistent with the Dharma Libra modulation amplitude. Uh, but this is now continuing uh, and being upgraded and will be uh, uh, a very promising way to test the, the Dharma modulation. There's more experiments under development Saber, Cosinus, and, and Piccolon, uh, which, which all essentially plan to, to work with improved versions of the Dharma crystals. Now, the problem, of course, is that whenever you search for annual modulations, you require lots of statistics. Uh, and Dharma, of course, has been accumulating statistics for many, many years. Uh, so, so it will take a while for any experiment to, to kind of catch up with that. So an important question to ask is whether we can instead test the Dharma signal based on measurements of the total rate in sodium iodine. And this is indeed a, a strategy pursued by the Cosinus collaboration, uh, which is taking sodium iodine crystals and making them cryogenic, which means that you can then not only detect the scintillation light, but also phonons, and thereby um, obtain the ability to discriminate between nuclear recoils and electron recoils. 
So uh, potentially this should lead to a very substantial reduction of background uh, as well as, as a lower threshold. So um, this, this would uh, hopefully give a very low total rate and then raises the interesting question of how you would use that uh, to essentially test uh, the DAMA modulation hypothesis. Now the problem with this is that as soon as you need to compare a total rate and the modulation amplitude, you reintroduce model dependence. You don't have the model dependence regarding the, the kind of uh, recoil rate in the detector, but uh, most importantly, you have um, model dependence regarding the assumed dark matter velocity distribution. Uh, and to illustrate this point, let's look at a, maybe a bit contrived example. Uh, where we assume that the DAMA signal is, is due to a single dark matter stream. So this is, in a sense, the most optimistic scenario from the point of view of DAMA, where uh, essentially there would be a, a dark matter stream with uh, such a velocity that it would be essentially just below threshold in, in winter and just above threshold in summer. So without quenching an energy resolution, this is kind of the recoil spectrum. That, that you would see in DAMA, but then actually after including quenching and energy resolution, this gets smeared out and you actually end up getting something that uh, gives a pretty good fit both to the energy um, distribution seen uh, in DAMA and the, the time dependence. So this is at least logically a possibility. And it's, it's clear from this simple argument that the very first thing that you need to do if you want to compare total rate and modulation amplitude is to make sure that you wouldn't miss such features. So you need to achieve a threshold which is a lower, potentially significantly lower than DAMA. Now, fortunately, this is something that, that Cosinus in particular can do uh, due to this cryogenic technology. But still, if you want to somehow perform a fully model independent test of DAMA, what you need to do is achieve a total rate which is smaller than the modulation amplitude uh, seen in DAMA. And, and if you, if you want, want to do this with essentially no other assumptions, this means that the total rate that you need to achieve is of the order of uh, 10 to the minus two events per kilogram per day. This is a very ambitious goal, um, even for an experiment uh, like Cosinus. So likely there, there need to be some model dependent assumptions. And one thing that you could do, for example, is to fix the, the particle physics model, for example, to spin independent scattering, but allow completely arbitrary dark matter velocity distributions. And you can show that in this case, it would be sufficient to achieve a total rate of the order of 0.2 events per kilogram per day in order to uh, exclude any interpretation of, of DAMA in terms of spin independent scattering. Uh, so this is, this is now much more feasible. This is factor 20 larger than this, this most, uh, most model independent requirement, but it's still a factor of 20 or 25 lower than, than what has been achieved by cosine 100. Uh, but this is potentially something that, uh, that will be achievable over the next couple of years. So this brings me to the second part of my talk, uh, which is about daily modulations. Uh, this is something that we've already heard about in the previous talk, uh, which is uh, the very crucial observation, which again follows from the, this wimp wind, uh, that the dark matter flux is not isotropic in the laboratory frame. And in fact, we are in a very lucky situation where it turns out that the angle between the uh, rotation axis of the Earth uh, and the wimp wind is almost 45 degrees. And what that means is that the direction of the wimp wind uh, changes by almost 90 degrees over the course of 12 hours. Uh, so in this case here, you would have essentially the wimp wind coming from the Z direction at midnight and then 12 hours later, uh, the wimp wind would come from the X direction. Uh, so this is potentially uh, another very, will, will impose uh, another striking modulation on the dark matter signal. There are essentially three different ways uh, how this change in direction can lead to detectable effects. Uh, the first one is if in some way the probability for dark matter particles to reach the detector depends on where exactly the detector is, meaning how far dark matter has to travel through the earth to reach the detector. 
The second uh, possibility is that the scattering probability itself depends on the orientation of the detector relative to the incoming particle, so that the scattering rate becomes a function of the orientation of the detector. And then the third possibility, this is what we, what we heard about in the previous talk, is that the detector response is sensitive to the direction of the recoiling particle. So that even if, if the flux uh, is time independent and the scattering probability is time independent, we can still see uh, or reconstruct the directionality from the recoiling particle. So I'm not going to talk more about this third possibility, but instead I want to talk about the first two possibilities. The first possibility is uh, to obtain these diurnal modulations from scattering in the earth. And there are essentially two different ways why this could be interesting. Uh, the first option is that dark matter particles actually have quite strong interactions, much stronger than what we normally assume for WIMPs. And if this is the case, then you could imagine that dark matter particles actually have a mean free path, which is uh, shorter than uh, kind of the, the size of the earth, meaning that they will scatter on the way to the detector uh, in the underground laboratory. And then depending on how much earth they need to travel to to get uh, to the detector, their flux will be more or less attenuated. And you can see in this plot uh, from, from a paper from a few years ago, how this can potentially lead to a modulation uh, that's close to 100% uh, between the point with maximum attenuation and the point with minimum attenuation. The second option uh, pointed out in, in a very nice paper from last year is that uh, you can actually only detect dark matter particles if they have previously scattered. So the idea here is that dark matter particles first need to upscatter in the, in the rock surrounding the detector and then they can release the energy uh, that they've picked up in this upscattering in the detector. Uh, so then again, uh, the, the magnitude of the signal that you're going to get will depend on the probability of this upscattering, meaning on the amount of, of rock uh, that the, the particles have to travel through. And again, this leads to, to daily modulations. And, and you actually see something interesting in this plot here, which is that in contrast to the annual modulations, the peak of the daily modulation isn't, isn't fixed at all. So this could even vary over the course of, of a year, uh, depending on kind of the overall orientation of the laboratory uh, to the wind wind. So this is the first possibility. The second possibility is that uh, one obtains a diurnal modulation from the scattering probability itself, meaning that the, the kind of differential event rate becomes time dependent. Now, this isn't the case for conventional detector materials because those are approximately isotropic, meaning that the scattering probability is independent of the direction of the incoming dark matter particle. Uh, but over the past couple of years, there have been many kind of new detector concepts that have been proposed in particular with the aim to lower the energy threshold and extend sensitivity to potentially much smaller dark matter masses. And, and many such materials actually exhibit uh, a very important anisotropy. And, and this anisotropy may result in an anisotropic scattering probability. And indeed, the, the resulting diurnal modulation may be essential for these kinds of technologies, because if you have a very low energy threshold, you can expect backgrounds from impurities and, and thermal noise. And these modulations may be the best way of, of suppressing these backgrounds. Uh, one example that has been worked out in a lot of detail is the idea of optical phonons and so-called polar crystals uh, like sapphire or gallium arsenide. Uh, again, this is kind of the time dependence of the signal that, that you could expect uh, in, in such materials. A material that, that I want to talk about because I've, I've worked on this in, in some detail are Dirac materials. So Dirac materials are quantum materials in which the elementary excitations can be described by a Dirac equation. That means there's an energy momentum relation that looks like the energy momentum relation of a relativistic fermion uh, with the momentum replaced by the lattice momentum, the speed of light uh, replaced by the Fermi velocity, and the rest mass replaced by the band gap. Uh, and in particular for, for large lattice momenta, the dispersion relation becomes linear. So you effectively have electrons that behave 
like free relativistic fermions. Uh, this in itself is interesting, but what makes these materials so attractive is that the band gap delta can be really tiny, as small as something like 10 milli electron volt. Uh, so to give you one example, uh, zirconium telluride is such a material. This is what it looks like in real space. And this is the band structure in, in reciprocal space. Uh, and this has uh, both been, been measured and calculated with density functional theory. And indeed, you find these band gaps that you can see over here and over here of the order of 10, 15 milli electron volt and Fermi velocities of the order of 10 to the minus three or so. Now, calculating uh, differential event rates in Dirac materials uh, turns out to be uh, quite difficult because you don't only need the kind of particle physics and astrophysics, but you need to worry about in medium effects uh, to do, for example, with the dielectric tensor and the polarization tensor in the material and the transition probability. But all these details um, have, been, have been worked out. Um, I'm going to skip the details. But the key observation is the following, uh, which is that scattering in a Dirac material is possible only if the velocity of the incoming dark matter particle is larger than the Fermi velocity in the direction of scattering. Uh, and this is important because the Fermi velocities in Dirac materials often exhibit very significant anisotropies. Uh, so in, in the example that I showed before, uh, with zirconium telluride, you see that in the x direction, the Fermi velocity is of the order of 10 to the minus 3, and it's about a factor of 2 smaller in the z direction. And, and just to remind you, the typical um, velocity of, of incoming dark matter particles is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 times the speed of light. So this is comparable to these Fermi velocities, and that means that actually scattering will be suppressed when the x direction of the detector points towards the wimp wind, and it will be enhanced when the z direction of the detector points towards the wimp wind. So this is exactly what gives rise to these daily modulations in Dirac materials. So we've worked out uh, some sensitivity estimates for this material and, and others, uh, for example, organic Dirac materials. And what you can see here for two benchmark points is indeed that you get these very large daily modulations potentially, and also that you can achieve uh, sensitivity to very interesting parameter regions. This also goes back to the question we had after the previous talk. So with these Dirac materials, you can potentially uh, test dark matter particles down to something like 10 keV based on, on just energetic arguments. And the region that's shaded here is the region where you could hope to see a three sigma evidence for daily modulation. Uh, uh, meaning that in, in this range, you wouldn't uh, need to rely on, on the total rate, but really just the modulation amplitude. And, and this would in some sense be independent of potential backgrounds. This is based on a kind of optimistic exposure of, of one kilogram here. Uh, just for comparison, there's a dashed line here, which corresponds to the kind of preferred parameter combinations for the freeze-in mechanism with a dark photon. This is one of the most ambitious targets for direct detection experiments because freeze-in uh, always requires extremely small couplings. But with these kinds of detectors, you can potentially reach down to, to these uh, tiny interactions. So I'm almost done, just one slide with, with a short advertisement before finishing. Um, if you're interested in direct detection, and I suspect many of you are, then I would suggest that you have a look at this software tool that, that uh, I've been developing together with, with others, uh, which is essentially on the calculation of dark matter event rates and likelihoods for various particle physics models and various experiments. So in the most recent release, we have kind of full support for the, the, the general set of non-relativistic effective operators. And we are now working on an update, which includes annual modulations for, for arbitrary interactions and arbitrary dark matter velocity distributions. So that brings me to my conclusions. Uh, the starting point was the, this very simple observation that the dark matter flux in the laboratory uh, is predicted to vary uh, both in magnitude and energy over the course of a year and uh, in direction over the course of each day. And, and as a result of, of all of this, many dark matter signals are expected to exhibit annual or daily modulations, which may enable us to distinguish them from backgrounds. 
uh, for annual modulations, kind of everything uh, revolves around this mysterious Dharma signal. Uh, but now we are really at the point when new experiments are coming in to comprehensively test this interpretation. Uh, to do this in a model independent way is, is tricky and requires sodium iodine detectors, as well as techniques for comparing modulation amplitudes and, and total rates. Uh, daily modulations can arise in many different ways and can have many different uh, shapes in terms of amplitude and phase. Uh, but one really interesting idea, in my opinion, is these daily modulations from anisotropic scattering probabilities, which you get, for example, in Dirac materials. And these materials actually offer a very promising strategy for testing dark matter models in completely unprobed parameter regions, very small masses and, and tiny couplings, even when backgrounds uh, may be difficult uh, to control. Thank you very much.